Hello, a blessed uh, Friday evening to you all and I hope and pray that uh, you are all well and uh, welcome to our Pagasa Center uh, Evangelistic Night. And um, I am pleased, I'm privileged and I'm honored to be part of this uh, gospel mission. And I would like to greet Uh, our uh, senior pastors, uh, Bishop Dr. Godofredo Ambat and uh, Pastor Shirley Ambat for giving me this opportunity to share the word to you today. And also, I would like to greet our um, pastors in Pagasa Center, uh, UK, uh, Pastor Gosh Ambat and uh, his wife, Sister Karen, and to our uh, Pagasa Center Philippines Pastors, uh, Pastor Allen Bakani and uh, Pastor Rasay Bakani, and to my co-pastor in Pagasa Island, Center Island, uh, Pastor Doris Naturata. And uh, to all the primary leaders of uh, Pagasa Center, to all the 144 uh, leaders, um, brethren, friends, families, and guests, a blessed evening to you all. And uh, before I pray, I encourage you to uh, let us all bow our heads together and close our eyes as we open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, uh, we come before you. We declare that you are the Alpha, the Omega, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, You are the God Almighty, our everlasting Father. And Lord, uh, we come before you, we humble ourselves before you. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you will grant us grace and mercy and uh, wash us and forgive us for all the sins that we have. So Lord, um, thank you for this uh, wonderful evening an opportunity to uh, glorify your name and uh, we take this uh, opportunity to proclaim the truth the word of uh, your truth and I pray Lord that to all those who will hear your word tonight will bring a lasting message to their hearts Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us in this gathering. And I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will do the work that only He can do. is to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of their soul. So, Lord, be with us tonight. And it is all for your glory alone. Help us, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and everybody will say Amen and Amen. So, I want to turn to our text this evening in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, which is the portion from which we will read one verse which we want to concentrate on this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, the last chapter of Paul's first epistle to Corinth. And we read verse 22. And we read verse 22 together. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Amen. I want to speak to you under this text, the title, Better to Have Loved Than Lost. I'm sure you all knew well, you all know well the saying, it is better to have loved and then lost than not love at all. But very seldom that we hear such a saying, applied to the spiritual realm. And that is what I want to do this evening. I want to say, better to have loved Christ 
than to be lost. For effectively, that is what the Apostle Paul says in his closing remarks in chapter 16 of the first epistle to the church at Corinth. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. So the word for love here in this verse is a strange word for Paul to use. It's only the second time he ever uses it in the whole of the New Testament and the only time he uses it in relation to love toward God. It is the word filio. He usually uses the word agape, the love of God. But filio means a tender affection towards someone. It's a feeling or an emotion and an experience that we can have towards other human beings. But he uses it concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in this verse. What the Apostle Paul is saying from his warm heart of love towards the Lord Jesus Christ is that he could not tolerate any indifference toward the Savior. It's great for someone to have an agape love, the love that really pleases God towards the Savior. But the Apostle Paul is saying here that he cannot tolerate anyone not even having an affection, a tenderness towards the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that as far as he is concerned and he is inspired by the Holy Spirit, there can be no neutrality in our opinion and our disposition towards the Lord Jesus. So much so that he pronounces a curse upon those who do not love Jesus. Let them be anathema. So that simply means to be accursed. Or some put it to be departed from the people of God. Cut off from the congregation of the righteous. To be divorced from the favor of God. For God not to lavish any of His goodness or grace or mercy upon you and ultimately to be delivered up to God's vengeance and God's wrath. Anathema. And then he says, Maranatha, which simply means our Lord comes. Now put all those things together and you get simply this meaning. I think if any man does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed when the Lord comes. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ came to Bethlehem, but he, we know from the scriptures and from his own testimony, was the pre-existent Christ. He lived before Bethlehem. He is the Son of God. It was only at Bethlehem that he was born into this world, having taken human flesh. But the Bible tells us not only of the first advent of Jesus that we will celebrate at Christmas time, but it tells us of a second advent. And there are probably about eight times more prophecies concerning the second coming of our Lord Jesus than his first advent. And we know that he came the first time. And we can surely therefore be certain that he will come again. 
the question is to you this evening how will he find you what will your disposition be to Jesus when he comes will you be one of these people who love the Lord Jesus will you have an agape love to him a fervent love that God has inspired in your heart will you even have a tender affection toward him or will you be someone who loves the name and the person of Jesus Christ there are some like that in our world today they cannot stand the name of Jesus they curse it and use it as a curse then there are those and they do not love the Lord Jesus they do not loathe him they are just lethargic concerning him take it or leave it I'm not really concerned I'm not that religious I'm not into these things I know he was a good man and all the rest and I respect him in a kind of in a kind of way but I do not love him I wonder which you are this evening now I want to give you first of all this evening the reasons why people do not love the Lord believe it or not maybe it seems outstanding to you here tonight that there are some who do not love or have a tender affection towards the Lord Jesus Christ the more surprising fact is that it is not the obvious that it's those who are in pagan lands and the heathen who have never heard the gospel and where no missionaries have been or gospel evangelists have preached but it's in those who have heard about him maybe from a child in uh, Sunday school those who have grown up in a Christian environment and even in a Christian home or at least a Christian or at least a Christian society so-called where there has been an influence of the gospel it is they so often at times who loathe Christ they do not love him rather they hate him they reject him now why is that well the first reason that I want to give you why people do not love the Lord is that they love their sin too much they love their sin too much actually in this first epistle to Corinth although it was written to Christians there was a great problem in the wicked city of Corinth of immorality so much so that it actually infiltrated the church and although it is written to the church we even get in the church characteristics of what was going on in the world and society outside of Corinth it's no different than what's going on today in our world incest had infiltrated this assembly we are told that a man married his father's wife his stepmother and committed incest and also committed therefore adultery and fornication we read as we go through this book that some of the people some of these people were in danger of dubbing in prostitution because there was a great temple in the city of Corinth and they worship false gods but they worship them in a sexual immoral worship through prostitutes sacred 
Vestal virgins, they were called. Then, there were others who were getting rid of their husbands and their wives for sometimes religious reasons. They were getting divorced, separating from them. Then, there were others in this city who were committing sodomy or, as we call it today, homosexuality. There were even male prostitutes in the worship of gods in Greek society. Then Paul wrote of idolatry, warning them, those who were bowing down to idols and worshiping these false gods and even going to the temple, he was warning Christians against going to the temple and eating of meat that is offered to idols. There was theft, there was greed and slander. There were swindlers in this particular age. So much so that he even had to speak to the church and tell them not to go to court with one another for greedy gain. Then there was drunkenness. Drunkenness, but believe it or not, this drunkenness was found not in the gutter or in the public house, but around the Lord's table. What an awful thing. You might say, it's an awful thing. All of these things are awful things. And they are in our world today. I might be speaking to someone who has been tainted and affected by those things. And maybe it's uh, an habitual desire for those things that causes you to love your sin more than loving the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reason for you stopping loving Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, Paul actually recites most of the sins that I mentioned there. But he says these words, Know ye not that the unrighteous, that is the people that commit these things, habitually in their lifestyle, they are unrighteous, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, Paul is saying that sinners do not get into heaven. If you've got sin, you cannot get in. But the miracle of God's grace that is preached in this epistle is that Paul could say to them, but such were some of you. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are purified and justified in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord, and by the Spirit of our God. God had cleansed them. So they had to depart from this whole way of life that was unrighteous. This is the message of God's gospel. That though men are sinners, and cannot get into heaven of themselves because of their sin, they can be saved by the grace of God and the gift of the Lord Jesus. Oh, my friend, do you realize this this evening? Maybe you're too attached to those specific sins that you let them go to take hold upon Christ in love of him do you love your sin too much is that is what is keeping you back from uh, loving Christ and owning Christ and confessing Christ a second reason was that they love themselves too much you can do that as well as you know, and that is equally a sin. 
But it seems to be at times a more acceptable one. In fact, at the beginning of this particular epistle, Paul castigates them for relying more on their own human wisdom than on the grace of God and the crucified Christ. In fact, Paul says, we preach Christ and Him crucified. The preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. But unto us, which are the saved, it is the power of God. It might be a stumbling block to the Jews. It might be foolishness to the Greeks. But the gospel is your only hope. It doesn't matter how intelligent or clever you are. It doesn't matter what ability you might have. Self cannot save you. Could it be that you're here tonight and you think that because you're a fine, upstanding uh, member of the community or even an officer in the church or a communicant, that you will be okay. Do you know what you're doing? If that is the foundation of your dependence, that means you love yourself more than Christ. So they love their sin too much. They love themselves too much that they did not love the truth enough. What am I talking about? Well, at the beginning of this book, there were divisions. And the devil loves to bring division into families, division into society. He loves to bring division into churches, there are division makers and they run to and fro from church to church and they are not of God. They go out from us because they are not of us. And they are the devil's meddlers. And they love not the truth. Then there were the false gods. The false prophets, they were running in and out as well, prophesying all sorts of ecstatic and charismatic utterances. And they were false. They had not the truth. Then there were false teachers. In chapter 15, he writes to them about the resurrection of Christ, warning them that there are there who say that Christ has already risen. And Paul says that if that is true, we are of all men most miserable. And we are still in our sins if Christ is still in the grave. Then there were the Judaizers. Who were they? Well, they were the legalists. They were the people of 600 and more rules and regulations over and above the Bible which you had to keep in order to be saved. Yes, they said it's okay for Jesus to have died for our sins and rose again and you must have faith in Him. But you know, you've got to do this, do that, and more. You've got to keep the laws of Moses and the rituals. You've got to get circumcised. The ceremony must be kept and practiced. My friend, this was all a lack of love for the truth, which betrayed a lack of love for the Lord Jesus. The fact is, these heresies and falsehoods and divisions were actually causing them not to love Christ as they ought. Potentially, you could be unsaved in this place this evening. And these are the very things that, that are hindering you. A division. Someone is a Christian or so-called. And then they have something. They have done something against you. And that is the very thing that 
that is keeping you from Christ. Maybe you are listening to false prophets and uh, uh, false teachers. Or maybe you are wrapped up in some kind of uh, legalistic religion or a cult. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't really matter. But if you think you can get to heaven and to God with more than the cross of Christ, you're deluded. It's the cross. Nothing more and nothing less. In fact, Paul said when he pronounced another anathema in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, Though we, the apostles, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Anathema. As we said before, he says it again. So say I now, again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Do you know why it is uh, such a tragic thing to have a gospel that's different from this book? Because it keeps men from loving the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth brings people to the Lord Jesus. Is there someone here now and you don't love Jesus? And the reason you don't love Him is you love your sin too much or you love yourself too much or you don't love the truth of God enough. Let me give you this evening what's more important. The reasons why you should love Him. It's strange to me. Indeed, it's even saddening. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that it shows the, st the stupidity of sin. Why men do not love the Lord Jesus? In fact, it is absolutely unreasonable not to love Jesus. Because there is everything in Him to love. He is the altogether lovely one. He is the fairest of 10,000. He is the altogether lovely one and lovable one. So why this then? Men do not respond to Him in love. Well, if you respond to love shown toward you, usually the response comes in a twofold manner. The first, I think, is gratitude. If someone shows love toward you, for example, in a practical charity, you usually express gratitude. That gratitude shows you that you appreciate what they have done for you. You're thankful. You really do thank them for what they have done. And when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the portrait in the picture gallery, the portrait in the picture gallery that we find from Matthew through the book of John, we find that he never ever did anything to discourage a man or a woman, a boy or a girl from loving him. In fact, he never ever did an evil deed. He never ever cited a man with evil intent in his words or in his actions. In fact, to the contrary, we read that he humbled himself. He came as a servant to God. He took upon himself our nature, our humanity, apart from sin. Of course. And the Bible says He lived for men. He lived for you and me. He died for men on the cross, bearing their sin. He rose again for men. And He is willing now, as He is risen, 
ascended at the right hand of God, He is willing to do every good for mankind. And the greatest good that He has done is opening heaven for us. Now, what you not to show gratitude towards the Lord Jesus for all those things? Should you not love Him because of what He has done for you? But then the second response we often have when we become recipients of another love is esteem. Not only do we have gratitude, but we esteem the one who has shown love to us. And no, I could not even spend time here tonight speaking of the esteem that we ought to have of the Lord Jesus. For He is not only the humble servant of God coming to earth to die on the cross and bear our shame and our iniquity and the contradiction of sinful men. But He is the very Son of God who came. He is God's only begotten. He is the darling of God's bosom who was sent. Ought we not to esteem Him and worship at His feet and say, My Lord and my God, He should be esteemed as Savior. For that is who He is. He came to save men. Not to condemn them. He went to the cross and shed His blood to save them and rose again to save them and ascended to heaven so that at the right hand of God He could save to the uttermost all who come unto God by Him because He lives. Now, why? Why do you not love Jesus? Why do you not love Him? You should love Him because He loves you. He first loved us. Verse 10 of that same chapter says, Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That big word simply means a sacrifice that satisfied God and exhausted God's anger to such an extent that there's none left for us because it was all poured out on Him. Should you not love God and Christ because of that? Paul could say in Galatians, The Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me, yes. Paul says, If you love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let any man like that be anathema. But my friend, my friend, do you realize tonight that the Son of God was cursed for you on Calvary Street? That's why you should love Him. Paul said in Galatians, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us because it is written in Deuteronomy cursed is everyone that hangs upon a tree there he was cursed of God and of men why? because he loved you he loved you so much and he was taking your curse that you might never be the anathema or anathema whichever way you want to pronounce it it's the same thing if you would only embrace uh, Jesus and love him the reason secondly why you should love him is that there is a course on those who don't Paul leaves no way of escape if you do not love the Lord Jesus you cannot be saved. You are anathema. There are no loopholes. There are no excuses. There is no fine print. There's no legal challenge. 
It's plain, black and white. Love Him. And if you don't, you will be lost. And that word anathema literally means, as I've said, let him be devoted to the wrath of God. To love not Christ is to deliver yourself into the hands of the Almighty, who can not only destroy the body, but can destroy both body and soul in hell. I cannot describe hell for you. Part of me doesn't even want to try, but it is an awful place. It is an indescribable place where the soul is cut off from Christ. The very center and root and foundation of man is severed from his Creator and is tortured perpetually throughout eternity. So just imagine that. Eternal, perpetual torture. He that believed the Son, Jesus said, has everlasting life. And he that believed not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. My friend, you should love Jesus because He first loved you. But also because there is a curse on those who don't love Him. Is there someone here this evening asking the question, Ben Ford, how do I know? How do I know if I love Jesus Christ? How do I know if I am saved? How do I know that I'm not cursed and won't go to that place called hell? Well, it's very easy to know. It's easy to know when someone loves another, is it not? They are the chief object of their affection and their primary in their life. Let me give you a number of examples or ways how you can know if you love the Lord Jesus. You will be engrossed with Him as the subject of your thoughts. He will be in your mind. He will be in your heart. He will be the darling of your life, your beloved. Your heart will beat for Him. Your soul will move for Him. Deep call will call unto deep at the noise of His voice. Do you know that? He will be the attractive theme of your conversation. If you love someone, you don't just think about them. You talk about them. Have you confessed the Lord Jesus? Have you told others? Could it be that because you have not, you don't know Him as your Lord and your Savior? You don't really love Him in this sense. If you love Him, pleasing Him will be your greatest delight. That's what you do for those whom you love, you please them. Do you live for Him? Fourthly, He will be the greatest influence on your character. You've heard about the one going down the aisle, the bride saying, I'll alter Him, I'll alter Him. And that's what happens, is it not? But we do alter one another when we come close to each other in friendship or marriage or whatever, we influence one another. We become like one another. If you love Christ, my friend, what I'm telling is, is that you will be influenced by Him and if you love Him more than any, you will be influenced by Him more than any. Fifthly, he will be the one who is most identified with your conscious life here on earth. And what does that mean? Because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. When men see you, when your life story is told at the end of your days, what men will see and hear and remember is Jesus Christ. 
and the love that you had for him and the love of Christ that you spoke about him. Another three things that are not Another three things are that you will look forward to his return. Paul said to Timothy, Henceforth there is laid up upon me for a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul says, let anyone that doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ be anathema. Maranatha. Jesus is coming. He is coming to judge those who don't love him. Then how will Jesus find you, my friend? Will he find you loving and looking and waiting and anticipating for him coming back again if you are not saved tonight you cannot do that maybe you are sitting here listening maybe you are saying i don't know if i am saved how could you look forward to his coming if you didn't know if you weren't sure Make sure. Do you obey His commandments? Jesus said in John 14, If you love me, keep my commandments. Don't, my friend, call yourself a Christian. If you are living a life that is filled with worldliness, the flesh, and maybe the devil himself, if you really love Christ, and if you are His you will obey him. Here's another one. You will love Christians. You will love Christians. Maybe it took you all in your power to get into this place tonight or listen to the message. However, you're listening to it. And I know some Christians are hard to love. I include myself in that. But the Bible says we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brothers. He loves not his brother, abides in death. My friend, do you love Christ? If you love Christ, you will love Christians, unlovable and all. You will love their singing. You will love their meetings. You will love being in their company you will love hearing them speak of the Lord Jesus. I'm not asking, do you admire Jesus? I'm asking, do you love Him? There are atheists and agnostics in our world who admire Christ. Gandhi admired Christ, who was a Hindu. But we are asking, do you love Christ? That's what Paul says is the distinctive of the child of God. I'm not even asking, do you abstain from hostility towards him? That's good that you don't take his name in vain. That's good that you think he was an upstanding man and all the rest. But the question is, do you love him? Do you have a tender affection towards him as you recognize who he is with gratitude and with esteem? I'm not even asking, do you take his name on your lips? You could say, I believe Christ. You could call yourself Christian and go to a Christian denomination. You could keep his day. You could meet his, with his people. You could drink of the emblem of his blood and feed upon the emblem of his flesh and not love the Lord Jesus. It's happening today all over our county or country, all over the world. I'm not even asking, 
do you work for him? I'm asking you, has Jesus touched your heart? Do you love him? One day, a man betrayed the Lord Jesus by the name of Peter. He was the one who said, Lord, I'll never ever disown you. In fact, I will die for you. I will follow you to death. Peter was renowned for shooting his mouth off. But I believe that deep down in his heart, he really did believe it. But the Lord told him, that the cock would crow and he would deny the Lord Jesus three times. And he did it with oaths and with curses over the fire because a little girl asked him, was he one of Christ's disciples? Out of the corner of his eye, he sees the Lord Jesus being taken away and Christ looks at him and he despairs and goes into the night and breaks his heart and weeps his eyes out. Surely that his Christian career is over. Surely that's all hope of apostleship and position at the right hand of God that he so yearned for has gone. But one morning, after the Lord Jesus' resurrection, on a seaside around a breakfast fire, the eyes of the Holy Christ looked into Peter's eyes through the smoke and the embers and pierced into the depths of his heart and said, Simon Peter, do you love me? And he did. And the Lord know he did all that he had done but he loved Christ and that's what the love of Christ can do my friend I believe Christ is here tonight and he is at your heart's door imagine someone in the dead of the night coming to your door or better imagine you you in the dead of the night breaking down in your motor car or something like that you're out in the middle of nowhere but you know one house of one friend and you know how to find it you get your way up there by foot and maybe it's minus four degrees you come up to their door and you wrap it, and you wrap it, and you wrap it, and you see the light on, and maybe you even can hear noise in the house, but they don't come out. They know that you are there. They know that you are out there in the cold, freezing. Hypothermia could set in, but, but they don't care. What would you think of a friend? like that you might be driven to curse them Christ is at your heart's door this evening he stands there knocking with a very sore hand he stands in the cold in the blasting winds of human suffering and the punishment for sin that he bore on the cross and he says to you outside your heart's door I have come a long way for you. I came from the splendor of glory in heaven. I went to Bethlehem as a baby. And then went to be despised. And then I went to Gabatha. And then to Golgotha. To hang there on the cross. And I did it for you. And now I'm here having risen from the dead and I have come to your heart let me in let me in my friend and he would say my feet are bare but for a covering 
all they have is blood. My head is uncovered, but for a crown of thorns, all these wounds, hand and foot, feet and heart, I beg of you, let me in. I've been here for a great while. The night is getting darker. It is getting colder. I'm dying to get in. Would you let him say that? My friend, won't you lift the latch of the door and shove the back the bolt and push open the door and let him in? He says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anatima, maranatha. But he also said in John 10, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Then, if any of salvation, anyone here tonight, young child, older adult, if any, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, that is, if any of communion, he will come into your life. He will change it. He will feed you. In John 7, he says, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. That is the if any of satisfaction. You will be satisfied. The satisfaction that you have longed for in your life of sin and self in this world and in falsehood, you will find in Jesus. But there is an if any of condemnation. And it is in our text. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. I heard the story just the other day about the Puritan John Flavel. He was preaching in a congregation like this on the same text. And there was a 15-year-old young man in the gathering. At the end of the message, he went to pray and then he said that he could not pro pronounce the benediction because he felt there that there may be someone who did not love the Lord Jesus Christ. And who would be damned? The preacher and the congregation went out with great solemnity. And that the young 15-year-old boy went out That young, 15-year-old boy emigrated to the United States. He lived to 100 years of age. One day, standing in his field, he remembered that night when Flabel could not bring himself to bring the benediction. And he knew that evening that he was one who did not love Christ. At 100 years of age, in the field, he started to love Jesus. So no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, where you have been, what you have done, Jesus is a Savior to love. And He loves you. My friend, will you not embrace Jesus tonight as He is freely offered in the Gospel? So for those people that I am talking to, or rather the Holy Spirit is talking to, will you not love the Lord Jesus tonight? If you want, I can help you. Say a prayer, and this could be the start. Out of your heart where you are sitting or standing there, 
listening to this or maybe even lying on your bed while you are listening just repeat these words after me out loud wherever you are out of your heart declare this with your mouth from your heart Lord Jesus I admit that I am a sinner now I come to you I believe that you are the Son of God I believe that you died for me on the cross I believe that you shed your blood on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins I believe that you died and you rose again from the dead and I believe that you will come again soon to rule and to reign forevermore Lord Jesus wash me and cleanse me for all my sins I turn from my past I turn from my sins I now turn to you as my Savior help me follow you as my Lord Holy Spirit and fill me and lead me into this life away from the fields of the world and direct my paths in coming to the Lord Jesus Christ he is my Lord and he is my Savior it is in his name I pray amen Amen and Amen. So if you have prayed that prayer, it is only a start, a beginning of your uh, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will grow this relationship of faith and transformation from what you were in the past so connect with the people who encourage you to listen to this message and uh, we in Pagasa Center would be more than uh, glad to help you and guide you in your new relationship with the Lord Jesus So let's uh, close this uh, meeting, online meeting, and uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we continue to glorify you and praise you, magnify, honor, and bless your holy name. And Lord, I pray for all those people who have not yet loved the Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you will draw them unto you by the Holy Spirit that they will be directed to Christ Jesus and salvation of their soul will happen so Lord help us minister to these lost people open up opportunities for us to bring the lost souls to your kingdom. And Lord, we do all of these things for your glory alone and not for anything else. It is for you, your kingdom. So Lord, uh, thank you for this wonderful meeting. Thank you for bringing your son Jesus Christ to save the world from eternal 
damnation. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. So, thank you very much for uh, listening and uh, uh, staying tuned. So, I hope and I pray that uh, we will see each other very soon. Thank you so much. Good night, good evening, good morning. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Bye-bye.